This is the Platform Podcast with B Bad and Brandon. We we are quite lost without Jason. We're like, Jason, we miss you. Every, when every, you listen to this, we need you. He's working at his real job. <laughs> it's because we don't pay him. Whatever. I pay him with love. <laughs> There's a lot of love. I bought him lunch once. <laughs> he, you just gone full scoop. I wish. I was going to say it wasn't the poke bowl, was it? <laughs> wasn't it? It was actually. It wasn't a cheeky poke. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I wish Jace was here for that part. <laughs> he loves that. He did you? Can we just all acknowledge how Johnny just scooped two scoops of Powerade straight into his mouth? Got to stay hydrated. <laughs> Got to get them electrolytes. <laughs> Even the junior burger knew that was that was a bit ridiculous. <laughs> Amy would be proud. That was awesome. <laughs> now, we welcome today Dave Norris to the woo, podcast. Woo, woo, woo. Thank you, Dave. Thank you very much. Oh, that was very deep. Yeah, I like yeah, that. yeah. Um, now, you've listened to a few of our episodes, obviously, because everyone listens to the platform. You've listened to all 80... What this is 84 now. 84? Or 83, sorry. Even the ones that aren't released. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I was like, well, we haven't even got there yet. I've got the inside road for the next one. Yeah. Um, so we start off with... Are you ready? We start off with 21, 21 words. You are going to deliver us these 21 words. It is a question. Who you are and what you do. We count not only the words, but the sounds. <laughs> like, that would be a word. We could argue two words. He's like, this is where... We could I'm... argue that's two words, in fact. <laughs> But this we'll let Brandon decide because he can't. This is where all our guests are like, what have I signed on to? <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> are you ready, sir? Ready. Go. Go. The best words that I can say. Gratitude. Thankfulness. Keeping strong. Being aware. You've got nine words if you want them. Ten words if you want them. Being well. Eight words. Balance. Seven words. Goals. Six words. I don't know why I had to think about it. Vision. Ooh. Five. This is a really good countdown. I'm only yeah. excited. Can't wait for the next one. Yeah, they're getting better. Resilience. Ooh. Great word. You've got four left. Empower. Ooh. Three words left. Question. Fuck, that was a good one. Ooh. Sorry, the journey burger. <laughs> Two words. Love. Oh, Peace. Yeah. Damn. That was. We, a, we haven't said this for a while, but I would like to say that is better than Luke Polly's. That is a lot better <laughs> than Luke Polly's. That was a. I feel like I. You really peaked that well. Finished like, I, I was like, when you said question, no, what was it? Question resilience? was nice. And then when you said empowerment, I was like, how the fuck is he going to beat this? Question. And then you said questions. And I was like, oh, he did it. Yeah, he did. Uh, we like question it. everything. Is that what we're doing? I guess there was a lot of verbs there. Yeah. There were. <laughs> a lot of doing. Yeah, a lot of doing words. Um, and I think that's, that's perhaps the, you know, where I come from is how do we, you know, through doing we become. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, when you <laughs> put on the spot and ask for some words... I guess they're the ones that sort of resonate yeah. with me and the people I work with and I connect with that are, you know. So let's, let's explore that then. Yeah, yeah that's a good segue because, you know, your 21 words didn't really tell us what you do, but mm. what's your line of work? So I, uh, I train classically through the university system as an occupational therapist. And for many folk, it's like, what on earth is an OT all about? It's quite a weird yeah, name. It's a, it's Occupation, a- people think work. So I'll break it down for you is that yep. life, we do many things, many activities, yep. and we call those occupations. So it's a wider definition of just work. It's yep. everyday activities. It's the things that we choose to do in our leisure time. It's the no. budgeting. It's the shopping. It's all these other activities that we have to do in our life. Um, of course, we've got work yep. as an occupation and the various roles that are out there. Mm. Um, and then there is how we interact with our environment, be it the physical, emotional, um, our cultural, our spiritual environments that we connect with. And uh, when people 
have something go wrong in their life. And the work that I do is with people with uh, neurological conditions, so think brain injuries after a car accident through to somebody having a diagnosis of Parkinson's, dementia, or after a stroke. Um, How do we put our lives back together? What are their occupations? What's the challenges to it? What are the things we need to rehab to make better so that they can reclaim their independence? Yeah, wow. So OT is very... That's I'll a, be honest, I've never known what an OT does. Yeah. I was, I've been fortunate enough to only found out this year, not from yourself, so right. <laughs> before I met you. Yeah, yeah. That's a very, almost, I wouldn't say broad. It's a broad church. Where do you study yeah. that? Yeah. yeah, well, it starts off with understanding activity. How do we break down what we do? I'm here sitting in a chair thinking about the words I've got to create. But what's happening? I've got to have core strength. I've got to have an attention. I have to have working memory. I've got to have all these facets on. So it's understanding how we do and understanding the intrinsic skills, the inside skills to be able to do that. Fuck, yeah. That's a lot of like minute detail that you've got to then transfer into like a bigger picture. That's it. Yeah, good point. Exactly. Well presented, mate. Yeah. So I'm it's proud of that too, Jim. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Bonus points. <laughs> Bonus points for Brandon. Um, it's that sort of um, designing, redesigning life um, after after an event, after after something said, okay, the path you're going on. No, it doesn't exist. It's taken a right-hand turn. We've got to shift you. We need now to figure out how do we get back there. Yeah, fuck. That's got to be a pretty, like, oh, it sounds bloody intensive job, especially, as you said before, like working with people who've been in a tragic, ac- tragic accident or had a brain injury, like, that's hard. How do, you, how do you even begin to piece some of life, one, back together, but then set them on a new path? Yeah, oh, look... I think the journey for me, I've been doing this for 20 years, so... What do you mean? You're only 20. (laughs) (laughs) Another 20. Uh, Another 20? (laughs) Where will I be then? Um, uh, You know, you start out and you think you know apples. You don't know apples. Um, And then you start to, you know, be more attentive and aware of where people are at. And it comes down to their goals. What do you want to achieve? And sometimes you've got to be the, the difficult question or difficult response around, I just think that's going to be really tough right now. What's the halfway step? What's the th- third step? What's the one-eighth step to get there? Could we focus on that for the next two months and see where we land? Yeah, right. Um, but when we think about achieving our goals, there's a lot of reward, there's a lot of benefit, there's a lot of re-per- you know, claiming purpose. Yep. You know, I've got purpose in my life. I'm doing this. This is where I'm heading. Um, and, and that helps because everything is available to help people, but it can be very overwhelming if you were to chuck the kitchen sink at them from a therapeutic perspective right up front. Yeah. So a goal starts and that then helps as a filter about what's included, what's out. We start here. That's my recommendation. But mm. what I do now is actually say, this is the map. And the map I might present as, different facets of where they sit against their peers so people their age similar education level where are their strengths what we what would we expect cognitively physically um and then create a map and so of this this is where we're sort of you know reduced at the moment these are the challenges where do you want to start on this journey What's yeah, important right. for you? Where do you want to reclaim? What's the thing that would be the turning point for you in three months, one month, two weeks, tomorrow, if you would have a change in what you're able to do? Where do you want to start? Because obviously, like, as you said before, with accidents, brain injury, there's going to be a lot of loss in this person's life. So to reclaim the purpose and setting that goal is going to give them a big, I guess, oomph of uh, well, purpose yep. to start. But... If the goal's too big, do you ever find like you have to really just bring it back down to the absolute like, yeah. you know, I just want to get out of bed? Oh, yeah, exactly. So I saw a guy um, first day back at, ho- at a hospital in a foreign country overseas, lockdown and COVID, expat, isolated, can't come back to Australia. Got very limited access. So we're doing um, tele rehab, so online Zoom stuff, think of that. And he couldn't walk up the stairs to get to the shower. He couldn't walk up the stairs to get the toilet. So that's, he was discharged from hospital over there, dropped into home, and they're like, oh, how do we do this? Shit. So, like, 
through physical capacity, couldn't walk upstairs? Post-stroke, couldn't wow. walk upstairs. And combining... Why is he <laughs> It's a different world over there. So combining that with cognitive elements, my memory's not as sharp. He had a particular stroke where it affected his spatial relationships. So perceiving the right-hand side of the world over here is a lot more difficult, inconsistent errors, bumping into things, not seeing complete pitch, inattentive. So wow. having to train all that up. And you're doing that via Zoom. Via Zoom. Wow. Yeah. That's got to be a challenge in itself. It presents as, you know, if you had asked me five, ten years ago, would, that, would I be able to do something like that? I would have said no. Now there are so many cool tools, great tools yeah, right. that I can deploy to that house that make it so much more accessible for yeah. him. Is it something that, um, when I just, like, obviously the COVID period, was that something that you were kind of forced into? Um, I was doing it before COVID. Okay, cool. Um, because when you look at or work with folk that have, you know, surviving brain tumour, car accident, you know, living with dementia or Parkinson's disease, it's, it's a lifelong journey. Yeah. And so there is a, a transition almost as a therapist where you get them started then you become a coach. Yeah, right. You need to keep the people accountable for the decisions or the actions and the goals and you know, taking those barriers out of the way over time. Yeah. And so that relationship needs to continue. And sometimes people travel, you know, good distances to come into the city to get started. Mm. But life is North Queensland, life is Northern Territory, life is overseas. Yeah, wow. So you start off and you, you're, as you said, you're swapping hats a lot. You, you become the therapist, you get them moving you to rehab them but then it's on them and you become a coach yeah very much right. so yeah that's a that is a like a difficult job yeah like to have an understanding of one type of like you know rehab in itself is a different animal to then keeping someone accountable and providing them with tools i think the the tying you know if you could think of it like stitching it all together is the goals yeah right you know, the goals determine the pathway of rehab, determines the relationship around the coaching type yeah. of relationship. Who else needs to be involved but advising? It's time to, you know, you, I'm seeing this, it's time to do this. Yeah. You know. Uh, so, and you obviously <clears throat> work with a conjunction of other th specialists. Yeah. So you're the kind of the glue that kind of keeps it all together? Or? Oh, I mean, people have relationships with their GP and I think that's the classic model in healthcare is that when I have something wrong, I go to my GP, but the poor old GP's only got 15 minutes. Yeah. They've got a very defined model of care and it doesn't translate to moving people along a health wellness continuum, particularly around neurological conditions mm. yeah. where a whole facet of life is damaged. Yeah. And, that, that, and then all levers are on the table about what you can do to influence it. So it's not a pill. Yes, yes, fundamentally, there is going to possibly be a medication question or something to resolve there. Um, but there is a whole host of other factors available to us to influence that sort of yeah, right. trajectory, that pathway okay. for that individual. And where did it begin for you? Where did the, the head, head injury... The, the neurological side of interest and in, like it's obviously your passion um you do many things other than like you have your own podcast memory yeah. health made easy yeah yeah um shout out thank you yeah <laughs> um where did it begin for you where did the interest spark um i guess i've been fascinated by aging by and aging. I, aging yeah okay and it's funny for a young fella yeah it was but always drawn to Aging, complexity, why? Why does that happen? Um, and fascinated by, I, I think, you know, story, stories mm. around uh, from older folk, fascinated about richness of life and what they got up to. And I guess those details then kind of were like, a, you know, the corridor which I then followed and stumbled down. Um, I found myself living as a young kid, had the opportunity to go on an exchange program, and I think we talked about sliding doors before, mm. um, was going down a very specific sports pathway. I witnessed in my sister an experience that she'd gone over and, and been an exchange student overseas, and I thought, awesome. Mm. I wonder if I can stitch up exchange experience with continuing my professional focus on sport 
and it didn't happen because where those countries were offering it was Spain, Italy, yeah. and I thought I was going there, and I wasn't going. I didn't go there. <laughs> what sport were you playing? I was playing water polo. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. And uh, I ended up getting shipped to Brazil. Oh. <laughs> And uh, I got dropped into, uh, and, for, and I say dropped, I, I was just, luck would have it, uh, end up being with a family who ran an orphanage and also an aged care um, wow. home that is in, the, experience. in the middle of Sao Paulo, which wow. is 20 million people. They had five acres of dirt. Um, the grandmother of the family... Um, end up having kids dropped at her doorstep because somebody thought that she was a caring person and she ended up accumulating more kids. And she said to the council at the time, that was 50 years before I got there, hey, I, I've got these kids dropping on my doorstep. I need some help. And they said, okay, well, look, the best we could do is give you this block of land, five acres. In 50 years' time, you can pay us back for 2% of its market's worth. You know, you've got this long lease... The end of 50 years, you've got the opportunity to buy. And I was there at about 48 year, and they were trying to rack up the cash to, to purchase it back. But we had 200 kids. Wow. You know, there would have been about 20 elderly folk yep. there, um, varying stages of Sorry, disability. So 200. 220 people that this family had to look after. Yeah, so it was it was not just them. It, it, it transitioned from yeah. just, you know, obviously my grandmother and her son, um, my Brazilian host father, um, to being a community. And we had, there was staff, there was also a pathway for the kids to get into um, education pathways because the schooling system was horrid. Mm. You know, the teachers got paid pittance and so they didn't turn up to school and they end up moonlighting and doing um, tutoring and they get more money tutoring. So they wouldn't turn up to the public school. So these kids wouldn't get an education. So they flipped it and they offered it through the, the orphanage to start build that education system there, but also a skills pathway. So we had a mechanics workshop, there was a printing workshop, <laughs> there was a sort of a haberdashery sewing skills type wow. workshop. And so all these kids then end up... had skills. They had skills. So it took them out of that pathway of poverty. That is insane. How old were you then? I was 17. Wow, that's huge to see that coming from here. Oh, mate, I I came from a, you know, white, middle class, very privileged, very green um, experience and dropped into there and you got people living in cardboard boxes, you know, my sister, my Brazilian sister, Marcy, I remember a very, you know, the first couple of weeks that her English was impeccable. She spoke with this beautiful uh, sort of slightly American accent because everyone's, you know, all the English teachers are American. Yeah. And um, she said, oh, I need to apologise for what you're seeing. And, and we're driving down this road and on one side you've got the mansions and on the other side you've got the favelas, which is yeah. all the poverty. Yeah, right. Um, and she said, oh, I have to apologise. <sighs> It is what it is, you know. That's incredible. Yeah. Like, for a 17-year-old kid to be, dro- not, as you said, not dropped, but dropped into that environment, that's, that's an experience that money can't buy. No, exactly. And I think that set me up. It explains to, why you are the way you are. To like, going, you're a fucking good person. <laughs> Sorry, Junior Burger. <laughs> yeah, we should have brought you email. Sorry, man. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, um... It just set me up on and that pathway, I guess, humanistic, um, understanding people, systems, um, why people behave certain ways. Well, that would definitely, because being dropped in that environment with 220 people at your, you know, you know, I guess access in a way to look at and almost study and you start asking questions like, well, how'd you end up here? Why'd you end up here? Yeah. And you become curious. Yeah, yeah. And that sets you down a very... That pokeball's repeating on me. Mm. <laughs> um, sets you down a very, I guess, succinct path of asking why. Yeah, I, it certainly did. And I think that what drew me to occupational therapy was that there was a real doing element, but scientific and creative, humanistic. Yeah. Mm. So that sort of fulfilled. Do you still have any contact with that place back in Brazil? I was just speaking to my sister this morning. No way. Yeah. I love it how you call, like you call your sister. Oh, they are my family. I got there, I, I hopped off the plane... Well, the story is, um, mum... Uh, Which mum? Brazilian mum. Okay. Had a dream about me. And 
the dream was uh, she's on a bus and she was out in the, the, the countryside of Sao Paulo in a bus, bus stops, and in gets this kid, curly, I did have hair then, curly hair, <laughs> um, blonde on the bus, and she saw my face. And then when, when they go and I talk, you know, offer, these are the students that are available. We've got somebody from Germany. We've got somebody from New Zealand. We've got somebody, blah, blah, blah. These are the kids. Mum just went, bam, that's the kid on the bus. Yeah, wow. <laughs> so that was it. And so I have arrived. And that's how you ended the, organ- the orphanage. Oh, the orphanage. <laughs> wow. And um, I've arrived and they're there and it's like one o'clock in the morning and I'm so jet lagged. And uh, in the car, my younger brother, Tekel, um, was adamant trying to influence me about what football team I was going to support. So the <laughs> first thing he wanted to sort out was, who do I go for? Yeah, yeah. You're going to go. Very important. Yeah, that. very important. Because <laughs> oh. I got dad in the front seat driving and said, no, 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 he's not going for that team. He's going for this team. And all the brothers are going, no, 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 he's going for this team. So in the end, I decided. Who did you pick? The brothers. Yeah. And so they were, they were feeling rather chuffed. Yeah. Um, but then I was also pretty quick to call dad, dad, and mum, mum. And that intent to was a choice that I'd already made but it opened up a rich dialogue a rich experience yeah absolutely if you went in there with an open mind going like, I'm going to really take advantage of like that's it's a fucking cool story <laughs> sorry was, kid sorry how, how was your Portuguese it's good it, how was it then horrid <laughs> I, uh, I got on the plane and we in fact at the back of the plane and then this days this is Aerolinas Argentina you could still smoke in the back of the planes then yep. <laughs> yeah. and so everyone's doobing up down the back of the plane and there was a group of Brazilian surfers so the whole plane basically this, think about this as a, a group of exchange students 17 year olds congregating down the back of this aeroplane and they're all being dropped off to Peru Chile um, Bolivia, wow. Argentina, Ecuador, um, Uruguay, Brazil, they're all on the plane. And so it was this sort of melting pot of Kiwis and Aussies and Brazilian surfers that had just been surfing at Bell. So I tapped up one of the Brazilian surfers and said, mate, you've got to tell me. The thing I'm dying to know is where is the toilet? <laughs> just teach me that and I'll be good. <laughs> yes. <laughs> There's one so, thing you need to know too. So I've come out with uh, uh, Onde Esta O Banheiro and <laughs> in my sort of Aussie accent and they're, what? <laughs> Onde Esta O Banheiro. <laughs> Shit, I hope he's told me it right. Oh, yeah, because you don't even know oh, if that's actually the right. Or is he just told yeah. you something else? <laughs> yeah, no, but I was just saying it terribly bad. Oh, so. That's amazing. Yeah. Kind of wish you did stitch up. That would be hilarious. How um, soon into your trip did you have to uh, deliver that? That, that question. Uh, it sort of failed me in that moment when oh, I did no. need it. <laughs> because I've ended up at the, pro, at the school because part of the, the whole exchange experience is you've got to go to school. Of course. It's, stitched, it's sort of tied to your visa. So um, I've uh, ended up in the school and the school is a relatively new school and it's all you know, marketed itself that we're teaching kids the sort of essential stuff to get them into the university because universities are like you can't get in. You've got to be at the top of your game to get in. Yeah, right. So I've gotten a, a little, you know, a chair in that space, very limited space. <laughs> and it's in the first week, I've leaned up against the wall and I've got paint, fresh paint, oh, no. all down the side of me because no one had told me that the sign on the wall says fresh paint, keep <laughs> off. And at the same time, I think it's the Brazilian black beans that are kicking in and Uh-oh. I've just gone, oh. And it's escaped me. I don't know where the toilet is. Uh-oh. I've run. I've looked, and I've gone into. <laughs> I've gone into the toilets. I found the toilets. Fortunately, everyone's in class, but it's toilets under construction. I went. You know what? This is good enough for me right now. <laughs> <laughs> There's some pipes connected to wherever it needs to go. Somebody <laughs> will sort this out. And, oh. and, and I've caused some damage that. I just went for cover and hopefully somebody sorted it out. <laughs> to this day, we still don't yeah. know. Yeah. So that is Onde Esta Banheiro wasn't working then. Yeah. Yeah. That is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Damn. And do you get opportunity to go back there? I did. Um, so as a young 17-year-old, I, I basically scratched my money together. My parents were really 
I'm very grateful my parents that were committed. I mean, to think about putting your kid on a plane at 17 and saying, yeah. good luck, mate. Um, we'll and see then you, see in a year. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and basically skin of our teeth to get me there um, meant that I didn't have much money. Mm. So I tutored a little bit of English, which gave me a bit of playing cash, but I didn't travel when I was there. I was very much embedded in that community, living in that community, and it was awesome. Mm. So I went back with my wife and introduced her to Brazil. Wow. And uh, cool. we spent uh, four months. And you four went, months. you caught up with your family? Oh, yeah, we lived with them. Oh, wow. Yeah, I lived with them. She got the whole royalty experience. Yeah. You know, get involved, went to the orphanage. And that, what was fasc- fascinating about that experience was as a 17 year old, I had in my mind the scale of the buildings and the place and the experience and then dropping in there 15, 16 years later um, it was a lot smaller than I remembered in my mind mm. Yeah, right. and I wondered about that perception of self to the world and memory and, and how that translated over time um, that the scale of it had, ch- uh, had shrunk a little bit but it was still there and mm. yeah, it's wonderful yeah, and you got to see the countryside. I got to travel. We got to do a lot of crazy stuff. That's really interesting, though, fun. how you, like, you say you remember it being bigger. Mm. Do you think you've compartmentalised it a bit, or you think you... you Probably... Um, or made it bigger than Inflated your it. Yeah, yeah, so It was very powerful. Yeah, 100%. Um, and its, it's gravitas, its meaning, its strength is probably quite pronounced. Um, and that emotion... Um, tied to memory is a really interesting thing because when we leverage emotional experiences and tie it to something like a new learning or a novel experience, it becomes a richer thing to hold on to or to retrieve. Mm. So that novelty, that richness would have been ampli- you know, amplified off the scale in terms of me digesting and mm. living that Yeah, as a 17-year-old. 100%. And it's yeah. such a raw age, too, where you are influenced by or heavily by your environment. Like, yeah. yeah. Damn. And then that was to segue. Was that an immediate transition to study OT? <laughs> yeah, we, re- yeah. we went a little bit off topic. Is that, that, or no, was I it think, something you just gravitated and fell towards after a few years? After a few years. Yeah. I uh, came back and I studied science. Because was it something popular? But was it a big um, no. covered thing? I mean, no. Not to say a bit old, but like you said, 20 years ago, I can't imagine something like OT was... Wasn't... Pr- what, was it? And it really got introduced... No. And it got introduced to me by a friend. Yeah, right. Um, that she was studying it. Yep. I t- tell me about it. What's it all about? I had no idea about yep. it. Yep. What do they do? And uh, through that conversation, I went, yeah, I'm interested. Yep. You've given me something there that really resonates for yep. me. And at the time, I was doing... <laughs> I was doing parasitology. Yeah. Because Ooh, sorry? I, parasitology. What is it? Parasites. I was oh, understanding right. microorganisms. I was in really? science pathway. Wow. And understanding Parasites. how cells and invading pathogens invading and how pathogens. things sort of leverage each other. Wow. So I was going down that pathway, but in about two and a half years, I went, you know what? I do not like looking down microscopes. <laughs> this is not Yeah, me. I can't imagine that being very... This is not me. Yeah. What am I doing here? <laughs> I just, I decided no. Yeah. And then and, and that, at that time, that was the conversation mm. that entered and I went, yes. And you sound like you really enjoy people. Like I do. Looking at a microscope, there's not a lot of people inside no. that microscope. <laughs> no. <laughs> there's I a felt, lot of things that could be inside people. Well, <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, true that. <laughs> yeah, and coming back to the sliding doors yeah. moment, it was, it was like that type of experience when I saw somebody who'd gone on amazingly in their professional career, the whole universe was that. And I had the same experience in dealing with the scientists and that community around, you know, studying parasites was that that was their world. Yeah, right. And I went, yeah, I want more diversity. Can yeah. you, sorry, a little bit of an intro. Uh, I forgot the word, interjection, but you used to talk about the sliding doors analogy. Can you please explain that a little bit more? Yeah, like... Um, it was a movie. Had Gwyneth Paltrow. Thank you. Yeah, there's a very popular movie about it. <laughs> Sound a bit younger than yeah. both of you lads. <laughs> but that sliding doors moment is that it, it could be an opportunity that you walk through or you close it and choose another door. Yeah, right. And life pops up like that. Like, yeah, yeah. You could have gone down that pathway. But you chose... I chose a different one. But yeah. then there was something at that threshold that I didn't want to walk through. Yep. Mm. And I made a choice. 
and there was a consequence of not doing that. And that consequence meant that that, that future... Literally life-changing. Was, ...was not there anymore. Yeah. It was something else. Yeah, that's cool. Do you... This is, sorry, I know it's going to be a different stream, but do you think in a... Do you believe in, like, alternate realities and stuff like that? Oh, there we go. Oh. Ultimate days. Like, do you think it, in a, there's, there's a timeline? There's another. Par- he's looking at parasites still. Yeah. Uh, yeah, but that's my thing. Like, do you think in another timeline that you you chose another door? You chose to stay down. I, I think that if there was an if there were different contexts around me at the time, I would have chosen that door. Yeah. Right. Um, I found very appealing in my sibling and my sister her ability to come back and speak fluently in another language. I thought that was awesome. Yeah. yeah, I thought that rocked. I thought, I want that, and and I didn't know what work was involved. I didn't know what that would look like to achieve that, but that was deeply attractive. Yeah, hundred um, percent. And so I went, and that context enabled me yeah, to make that choice. But without that context, you would have chosen something. I wouldn't have known. A bit like flavors, you know. What does chocolate taste like if you never tasted it? but I've been sitting in vanilla all the time. Mm. I, I don't know. I can't quantify the experience of that flavour, let alone that I actually, after I've had chocolate, I'm going to have chocolate chip in my vanilla because that's going to rock my world. Yeah. I'm going to make that choice now. So it's a bit like when you're exposed to that, and those contexts and what we build in our environment can help support those decisions. And stepping through that now is that that's very much what I do is that I mm. try and build context and environment for my clients so that it makes easier decisions to put things in front of them. Like when you've got an impairment for working memory, the ability to hold and retain information, we've got an impairment in, in our executive function. So problem solving, judgment, insight, awareness, how do I create a better environment so they can move through life easier? Mm and make choices that are going to actually add up to their recovery process. Yeah, right. So, so I didn't answer your question about alternate realities. That's fine. You kind of did, you kind of didn't, but it's like, it just popped into my head. I had to ask it. We're going to, we he loves talking it. talking about simulation earlier. <laughs> yeah, like it's, you know, the, the simulation theory, that this is just a simulation. Mm-hmm. So we're we all in the matrix. Yeah. <laughs> it's just well, a question, whose matrix we're in? Yeah, well, from a... A neuroscientist observation, when we visual, and you'd use this in training, I'd imagine a lot in your coaching role, but visualization and creating deep, sensory rich, step by step, almost physiologically creation of a vision of lifting, of doing, of a task is just as effective as real world practice, as in physically holding and doing. Mm. And it's interesting then that when we think about that, our brain is creating a reality quite regularly of which we're buying into. Mm. And so whatever we feed it visually, richly, mentally is creating the conditions for us to fulfill. Yeah, right. So we're going into our own prophecy. We are. Yeah. We are. Because whatever we... Well, it, it comes back to... Like, if I wish we had Jace here to zoom in on Johnny's face right now. But it comes back to whatever you do feed your mind becomes your reality. It does. What so you it, think you do. Sorry? What you think you'll do. That's it. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. Yeah. Which is a mind-blowing concept for... You know, it's, it's... So we're pulling in elements of how I feel how I how I respond to the world <laughs> Good yeah, like that way <laughs> yeah. um, how I feel how I how I mentally understand what I'm doing cognitively how I perceive the objects around me how my previous history has set me up what my internal belief system is about my personal capacity how I approach problems in the past what flavour of chocolate I've tried or what I haven't mm. are all things that are going to condition us to make a choice, mm. influencing our decision about what we do and how we do it and my perceptions of success That's very or expectations of success. It's, it's, when you put it like that, it's very easy to understand. 
or at least it's easy to some understand someone who's quite aware of their own limiting beliefs or sorry um uh, what's the word i'm looking for well i think you know, to to borrow like a the fishbowl analogy yeah you, you know you're inside your own fishbowl mm-hmm. i don't know what's I, there is no outside this is my reality mm. um one of my clients years ago, and I found it very challenging as a therapist, had um, limited insight after his stroke. And insight is the skill of um, perception of my errors. Yeah, How do right. I respond to my errors? That there is something going on. And, for example, um, he, he's... His role prior to the stroke in the house was he loved to cook. He, was, he enjoyed cooking. Hmm. And my whole starting of the relationship with him and trying to dig deep and tell me about where you're at before stroke, what has changed? Hmm. What's the difference in you? This self-awareness question. Nothing. Nothing. Wow. Okay. So tell me about how you're able to... Um, brush your teeth at the moment. How's that going? Yeah, I've got no problems. Now, what was happening for them in this very specific small task was that he could not stop brushing. There was no off button. There was no internal feedback to say, time to stop. He would just keep brushing. This was after an injury? After a stroke. Wow. wow. So but he, he didn't know. He didn't know. So you don't know what you don't know. Exactly. He had no feedback loop to say, Damn. it's time to stop. I'm, be I've been here with. for two minutes or I've hurt my gums or I've... I'm bleeding from the gums. I've got too much stuff in my mouth. Oh, wow. He didn't know how to stop or didn't have the cues to be aware of how to stop. Oh. And... We could, and there was no amount of putting him in that task that he could be self-aware. And so I thought, right, I'm just going to drop him into a kitchen task and see him at how he goes. I said, what meals do you think you can, you know, that you do? Oh, I do spaghetti bolognese. Right, how do you make it? He told me how to make it. And what are the steps? He told me what the steps are. I said, right, let's get in the kitchen and do it. And he started off and he said, I like to dice. I start with steak. I don't buy mince. It's going to work good quality meat. Mm-hmm. And lo and behold, same scenario as what we saw with t- teeth brushing, we saw with steak chopping, it just wouldn't stop, wouldn't stop, wouldn't stop, just chop, 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 chop. wouldn't stop, wouldn't stop. Wow. And I'm letting him go, I'm going, okay. He's mincing this thing. Yeah, yeah, oh, oh it's beyond mince. It's <laughs> pulverised, it's going to fall apart any second, like there's not going to be any beef left. And, and I've prompted, I said, oh, how are you going with the, uh, the chopping and the meat? Is it, is it ready? Oh, yeah, yeah, it's ready. But I've provided enough cue for him to trigger the next step, which wow. was then to turn the stove on, put the oil in. But in doing so, he forgets about the stove and he forgets about the oil. We now start having an oil fire in the kitchen. Shit. Turn so dials on. Really dangerous. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then he's in the, in the fridge and he's leaving the fridge open and can't pull stuff out of the fridge. And the fridge is left open and I'm going, all right. He's got no awareness about how to respond to problems. The only thing... And this is really interesting. The only thing that I ended up finding that worked, that moved the needle for him, was having feedback in a gaming perspective. Okay. And what happened was, is that when you play a game, a brain training game or any game, you get a score. But when you do brain training exercises, for example, you not only get your score, but you also get a metric about where you sit against your peers. Mm. And he's like, Oh, I've got to beat the score. Hmm. I've got to beat that. I've got to move that, ne- that number up. I'm better than that. And all of a sudden, we'd sow the seeds for insight. We're moving away from not having anything. We're starting now to move along a continuum to somewhere which is a little bit better. Hmm. Which meant that in six months' time later, he returned to work. Wow. Yeah, right. So... It's just figuring out these different strategies to try and understand tasks to what people need and then put something and then get that response and then move yeah. it the next needle. The next thing in front. That, like, in that would have been a, like crazy because like everything he's answered to you, oh, you at first stage you're probably thinking, oh yeah, he's cool. Yeah. If he says he's cool, he's cool. But you've got to really dig to try and work out what's going on. What's going on. Yeah. 
That's yeah. an, is like, that something common? You'll put people in scenarios like uh, teeth and brushing, cooking, that kind of stuff? A classic functional test that I might put on somebody is make a cup of tea and toast and have it ready at the same time. Oh. Now, it's just a, quite a... Oh, yeah. A very no- nominal no. task. I show them where things are. I show them the, the drawers. There's a memory function here now. You know, yeah. think about where things are in a new environment. Where is the... I'm not showing lots of stuff. Here's the drawer for the cutlery. Mm. Here's the plates... There's the fridge, there's the stuff. Mate, all I ask for you is to make a cup of tea and toast and put a, you know, I can then layer in extra requirements, butter with this on it and have it ready, but I just want them to say cup of tea and toast, have it ready at the same time. Yeah, right. And it's like all these facets then come, I then observe how they're putting it together. Do they open up all the kitchen cupboards? Yeah. Do they orientate themselves wrong? Do they? Can they put the PowerPoint in? Does it go upside down? Does um, so you're looking at every detail, everything, because it's telling me about how they're responding to the world around them. I'm getting a playbook of how they use, how they perceive, how their cognitive skills are, how the internal reasoning is going. Oh, I don't, I don't make a cup of tea, and then I'm never, I'm never really good at tea. I, I don't do tea. Oh, okay, well, let me show you how to do it. Mm. And I've taught them a skill. Now you do it. Yeah, fuck. So it's, it's an observation functionally which reveals a lot of how do we pull these dynamic s- systems together to get an output in real-world context. That's insane because, like, I'm a little bit mind-blown still. but mm. I'm a lot. Yeah. Like, <laughs> I'm not a little. Yeah. <laughs> Going back to, like, you know, that uh, poor fellow who couldn't stop chopping steak, like, and you're saying he's got no self-awareness or no off switch, and then he's able to go back to work. Like, that in itself is building awareness from absolutely nothing to a quite a big task. Like, we probably take for granted. Like, we just rock up to the gym, you know, one day he's got a mullet, one day he doesn't. Like, it's all... I had to throw that in there. He looks great. <laughs> he just got rid of it. He looks great. But, um... Sorry, I'm still like trying to piece it together. But feeding that back into self perception, yeah. How is like you're obviously influencing him to rebuild his own reality? Oh, yeah, in a way, because he's got if, if he doesn't have an off switch, he doesn't really live in a well, that's his rea- I'm went down a rabbit hole a little bit, yeah, yeah. I, I think I understand yeah. where you're going. The, the insult of the stroke has damaged certain um, pathways, certain circuitry and possi- and also cortical area, which is how things are connected a little bit. Mm. Understanding that geography helps. Yeah, right. Because um, you're then making an observation around neuroanatomy, neurofunction. What areas of the brain has been affected? What do I anticipate to be changed? What are going to be deficits that I will expect to be present for this particular person? One of the greatest challenges, though, in therapy is when somebody has an insight deficit. Yeah. Because you, at the end of the day, we are teaching people to be a problem aware. Mm. And when I don't have the problem awareness relationship, how do I help? When I'm relying on his effort to then feedback. And so coming back to my man overseas, coming back to this chap, the opportunity that technology avails us now is that I've got tools beyond the therapist's contact time which yeah, then right. can help people come, move along that continuum. I don't want to present that he got back to normal because normal is a lot different now. Mm. Normal was having still some supervisory element around his work, but he was working. Yeah. So it's almost uh, becomes the new normal. Like you said, they come, something stopped them and they're now this is their new path. That's yeah. right, yeah, yeah. So there's some of the tools, and I know that we've had conversations about different tools that are out there, mm. um, but the, that, that was one tool that really helped move the needle for that guy. Yeah, wow. Damn, so you're, just, you're just pulling up all the tricks out of the playbook all the time, just trying to find which one works. I want to know, how big is your person. fucking playbook? It's a big Because, <laughs> like, talk, you're talking about the, the, the uh, geography of the, the, the brain and the neuroanatomy. Like, how long did you fucking study for? Uh, well, because like you got to have rehab knowledge, you got to have neurofunction knowledge, you got to have pathway knowledge, like, and then the therapist, like, 
Are you the smartest person around? No. You're definitely the smartest person you get, in this room. You gotta, you gotta keep. Oh, by far. You gotta, <laughs> I mean, you're up, some, up against some t- tough competition. Uh, no, you gotta keep learning. Yeah, yeah. That's one of the joys of the job is you're always learning. Hmm. Um, you know, where I was a, as a young therapist to now, it was totally different. Yeah. The evolution um, of the um, profession must be massive too. Right? Yeah. Well, what was available 10 years ago. Um, to today has dramatically changed. The evidence base has yep. dramatically changed. The stuff that's leading edge is phenomenal. Yeah. You know, there's lots of opportunity, but there's also what we understand. You know, when I talk about our understanding of our beautiful brain, the most complex organ in the known universe, is that think about flight. We've gone from Icarus, you know, the you know, tr- attempt to fly with a... F- wax wings and feather mm. guy tries to launch a plane in early 1900s late 1800s we've got planes flying in world war one world two now we're putting dudes on the moon we're setting satellites out to the farther stars that trajectory that pathway is huge mm. but when we compare what we understand about the brain some neuroscientists that i've spoken to would i, I would say oh we're probably around that sort of you know trying to understand, you know, the, that sort of putting that first plane together. They said, no, no, we're in between Icarus and figuring out the first plane. Huh. Yeah, that's what because I was going to ask. How, how much do we know about the yeah, brain? Yeah, exactly. And we, 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 because it's such a hard thing to study. Yeah. You know, to, to, I just, to understand it, you've got to crack a skull and look at it. you got to you know, okay. They don't want to do that. <laughs> yeah. I just, uh, it popped in my head because I just watched it. Did you ever see the movie Lucy? That was, yes. I, I wrote that down. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. How much of the brain are we using? Um, it's an interesting question, but... Lucy says 5%. Yeah. Well, I'm also going to give a quick shout out to Scarlett Johansson. <laughs> oh. You are stunning and I love you. Marry me. Sorry, Jelly. She's my wife now. <laughs> <laughs> she doesn't know it yet. She doesn't even know I exist, but that's okay. Anyways, sorry, continue. <laughs> uh, um, it's a bit of, uh, you know, the hyped up observation about how much of the brain are we using and how much do we access. <laughs> At any given moment, we've got... Um, network networks firing off. So networks being neuron and networks don't think computers. Think that one neuron, the working unit of the brain, has ten thousand connections with other neurons to receive information, and equally ten thousand other endpoints communicating to other neurons. Now put together a hundred million neurons, you've got billions and billions of connections that when we have clusters of cells that fire together, so there's an electrical stimulation causing a firing of us and release of information of of a chemical nature causing a chain reaction down the line, these networks that fire off are happening that cause our behavioural response to the world around us. Now, those networks interact and connect with other networks. And it's this sort of dynamic interaction that's happening all the time. I think when we look at then how much we're using, we're using everything all the time. Mm. But how efficient are we? Are we using it? How much overwhelm do we have? And this is when I work with my clients, particularly after head injuries, is trying to find stillness first and understanding that calm space to perceive and respond to the world. Because it's such an overwhelming, over-demanding, firing off, Because there's input everywhere. Yeah, because they're fatigued. fatigue will be one of the big things that hit people after a head injury, is that they're exhausted. Exhausted having to attend, exhausted and having to communicate. And brain fog will be another part of that, sort of this fuzziness, this cloudiness about perceiving the world, responding, acting, doing. Yeah, right. And often there may be an overactivity, um, but we're not putting things on people's brains to observe that. And one of the tools that we've spoken about is um, having an understanding of the internal state in a way that we can then grasp mm. is using HRV, mm. heart rate variability. And it just gives us a nice little beautiful biological systems feedback on how are you operating. We now know a little bit more about when after a trauma, after uh, uh, you know, any sort of trauma, an inflammatory state kicks off, we're likely to see a more sympathetic state, a more overactive state. And that imbalance is putting us into this fight or flight response mode, mm. which then makes us more anxious, more, more likely to experience anxiety. 
And that's certainly part of that pathway after any head trauma, be it a head injury, be it stroke, be it any sort of illness that's impacting our, our brain, we'll often see an association with depression and anxiety. Okay. Oh. And that's just because they're constantly in a state of stress. Oh, because of. And that's a tough one. The causality is very hard yeah, right. to point to. And this is where the, the research is now is showing us that we are such a beautiful biological system that causality of why one thing is related and directly related to the other is very hard to, to make. However, we have a greater understanding of association that when this is present, your risk and likelihood for X is increased dramatically. So, so one plus one doesn't necessarily equal two. No. And, and, and say, for example, um, you know, one of the things I'm really excited by is, is how do we reduce our risk for conditions like dementia later in our life? And when we have one risk factor, let's call it, let's say it's cardiovascular disease present, and then we add in the diabetes at the same time, it's not one plus one equals a risk factor of two, but we know that these two variables increase the risk for experiencing, you know, later life dementia by significant fold. Mm -hmm. And when we add in obesity, when we add in all these other variables, stress, when we add in childhood trauma, when we add in poor educational status, when we add in lifestyle choices, you know, smoking. So it's like we're one, just, one plus one equals ten. Ten. Cranking it up. Yeah, we just cranked it right up. Our risk, our risk dial, we've just moved over here. Yeah, right. So how do we dial that down? And that's what I'm interested in, is helping people dial it down. And that's what yeah. your podcast yeah, that's is mainly what, aimed at. That's right. That's it. That's the whole intent behind that podcast, is just teaching people how to move that uh, down. And yeah. what, do you, what do you talk about mostly there? Because I know we've spoken about breath work. Um, I, you know, simple things are lifestyle changes, lifestyle mm. factors. You know, if we just made choices about what we eat, if we made choices about how we sleep, if we made choices about how we move and the fitness ex or exercise exposures we put in, in place in front of us, if we made choices about our chemical exposures, our environmental exposures from um, pesticides through to other um, uh, regulated and unregulated toxins in the environment, if we made choices about our circadian rhythms, our light exposures, and how that influences not only our sleep routine, but also how our, our cellular processes kick off mm. of a morning. If we made choices about those, simple lifestyle changes. Yeah, right. We are dialing, we're turning that, 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 that flame burner on the gas stove right down. Mm. Simple choices. And so the whole podcast premise is simple choices can have a huge impact in your life. Yes. Lifestyle choices are going to help address that accumulating allostatic load, yeah. that load that of wear and tear that we expose ourselves to, that when we have too much of it, we're moving our operational systems into a state of stress and new normal, which is going, it's okay to operate here, but we don't know how to get back to healthy yeah. and wellness. So we lifestyle really, choices can get really used to being in a state of heightened fight or flight. Exactly. So like that becomes everything like in this world, like in this world, rally, whatever you call it, this world is designed to put us in a state of fight or flight. Yeah. There's a lot of input, flash marketing, but not much dialing that down, as you said, bring us back to like just a still calmness. Yeah. My, my, my wife has had the, uh, the work policy order, we're returning to COVID, new normal, everyone back to work in the office. And I went, why? You're going to be so less productive. Yeah. I wonder about people's overall sense of stress in returning to the workplace. Why? <laughs> Why? Because they've now had an experience of working from home, delivering and also facilitating their lifestyle goals. Mm. managing family, making yeah. choice about food. I can put something in the blender. I've got all that beautiful fresh mm. fruit there. Just as an example. Oh, man, I've had so many clients talk about the experience of working at home versus having to go to work. Majority of them do not want to go back. Yeah. Or if they can, if they have to have a reduced, let's do a week here and a week home. Because the home environment, they like you said, they work better. Yep. Everything was better. My With, life is better because yeah. I can have a choice to zip out and grab that stuff. 
I can manage appointments, I can do stuff, mm. it becomes much more imbalance. Mm. And if I was to slap HRV on folk and just do a reading about what's going oh. on, I wonder about whether we're seeing a sliding scale from being that beautiful balance, a little bit more parasympathetic, but we've got a good balance going on and sliding them right down to, the, and to that sympathetic zone. Yeah, fuck. Are we going to see a lot of people popping? Yeah. I reckon we are. I honestly yeah. reckon like the, the, the worst thing about going to work is having, you know, if you think about it, you wake up, you're not too excited to go to work already. Then you're going to go sit on a train, car or bus for nearly an hour in oh. traffic. Oh. You're going to get frustrated. Oh. You show up to work, super fight or flighty. Yeah. You're ready to fuck up. Sorry. You're ready to get someone. Mm. Like, they don't experience that when, they, when yeah. they work from home. They get up, they make a coffee. They know, got to start work at nine. It's now 8.50. I'm just going to hop down. But if you even think about from a productivity point, I reckon people are working more at home. 100%. And delivering more outcomes than they would have in the office space. I think so too because of one, less distraction. Well, sorry, less external distraction. Distraction. Thank you, sir. That was a big one I heard. You don't have your co-makes coming up to you just saying, hey, 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 hey. Yeah. 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 Imagine that. But there's also like you now know that if say if this this project's due at this time, well it's due at this time. I can't fluff about. I got to get it done. Mm. I think I agree with yourself. Yeah. Productivity would have been so high. Mm-hmm. I'd love to see what happens in a few years' time. The more people that incorporate that for a workspace, the more people get to live where they want because they don't have to live close to city anymore. Um, you know, you can have big open areas and outdoors. Like everyone's just mm. going to be better mm. because of it. I think mm. It'd be harder to come and visit us at the gym here, but. <laughs> well, see, I think, but like again, I think there's such people get so much out of what we do, and I look at it from not just a physical point of view, but like the community aspect. Yeah. Like, I will just come here. Like last weekend when you had your final, I wasn't training, but I hung around. One, obviously, my client, but two, Thank you, sir. <laughs> I um enjoy the environment i enjoy chatting to kevy enjoy chatting to jade i enjoy traveling tra- it's been a long day <laughs> um, i enjoy chatting to the people here because i get so much from it where it's like people go to work they're getting a paycheck but there is nine times out of ten well that's probably a bit high eight times out of ten not much fulfillment happening mm. and i think you know going along with what you said in those 21 words like it comes back down to having you know, purpose and vision and being grateful for what you do have and mm. there's so many other big words in that those 21. positive emotional qualities those positive emotional states that we you know gratitude you know uh, as one of those ones um compassion um equanimity you know through difficult times um well, or eat, you know be good or bad you'll ride it and you'll come out okay it's going to be all right can you just repeat that word again Equanimity. Wow, I'm learning a lot of words. Yeah, today. fucking okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, As we said before, but, smartest person in the but, room but by but far. When you cultivate those emotional states, yeah. and when you bring them out and, and, and support them and try and live with them or bring them into an activity, you're going to have better recall. Mm. You're going to perform better. There'll be less stress. So these things, there'll be less anxiety. And when you combine that with a nutrient-dense, high, you know, beautiful, colourful f- um, foods that are from the farm, fallen from a tree, combine that with a bit of exercise that raises the heart rate, p- put some power into it, you know, resistance, you then start to get this physiological response but also a dynamic response there's a guy over in the uk that's coined the term the dynamic connectome which is this observation that we as an organism are influenced by all this stuff around us and we cannot separate ourselves from the stuff that's happening kind of very much what the buddhists talk about Mm. but in a science perspective the bacteria the fungi the toxins the light the dirt continues influences our physiological rhythm what can we control i can control what i put in my body Mm. i can control how i move i do have some control how i think i have some choice here i have control about how i feel but many of us feel out of control Mm -hmm. many of us feel very reactionary and after trauma after an injury this stuff becomes very dominant even without the trauma and injury though 
the impact that just applying these lifestyle changes is, as you said before, it's going to impact greatly. Why isn't it being? Why isn't it being um, introduced? Is it, why isn't it being taught more? Because it's out there. Mm. Like you talked about the exposure to light. I am, um, and then we get blue light from these these beautiful things. Yeah. I think. I think people like to pretend that's not a thing. Yeah. Like, and, how many people, like I'll say it to clients, and I'm, I'll suffer from it myself. And you, you say to a lot of people, like, I mean, just put the phone away for an hour before bed, maybe switch some screens off, do something else. You call that a bedtime procedure. Oh, yeah, I know that. So do you do it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, like, 100%. Like, I'm like, sleeping shit, though. Yeah. It's like, <laughs> there's, there's that real disconnect between um, um, identify and I recognize the value in that principle, that activity, that statement. But how do I embody that into action? How do they embody and carry that through into behavior? Um, and I think it comes down to a commitment to one, a commitment to a micro step in that direction. What is the one thing? It may be too Herculean for that guy to put that phone down, but maybe it is um, a small change that you're allowed it for five minutes and then it's got to go down. Or making something to change at a small scale, which appears easy to do. Mm. Because then once you've won there, it becomes easy to make the second step. Yeah, right. And those micro habits, I think, are the key. Mm. Is that when we make small choices but commit to one to achieve, but anything after that is a bonus and you reward yourself for doing it, but you still got to turn up and do the one, the small Mm. thing. And once that hook gets in there, it becomes easier to layer on to the next step the other thing that I think happens is um, and I, I heard um, the, that lady um, Ariana Huffington mentioned this in a podcast recently about her work in, uh, con- and her, her new project called Thrive Global and what is it that holds people back it's often a life altering event mm. that causes significant disruption behaviour change but why do we wait for that crowbar to happen? First off, let's start with micro change. What's one thing you can do right now? Mm. What's one thing you can commit to yourself today? If you're listening to this podcast, what is one thing out of all the stuff we've spoken about that you could potentially investigate to make one step? Is it about taking a food option out and adding one in? Subtraction's a lot easier than adding you in. Mm. The other thing is putting some bumpers around it. Maybe it's making a choice about eating within a time-restricted window. So time-restricted feeding. And that in itself will cause a tangible change around energy, for example. Mm. Yeah, wow. But the thing I wonder, like I keep thinking about now, is like you do some really cool stuff with people that have had life-changing event. What could you do with someone who hasn't had that and doesn't have a challenge with, like, lack of a better word, a, mm. a normal functioning brain? Like, what cool shit could you do with someone? Yeah, like, where do you start? What is my goal? I want to perform better. Well, what does perform look like? Is it in the gym? Is it in work? Is it in a, a particular pursuit in life? Normally, they will have a goal around doing something. Mm. All right, what do we need to get there? What are the aspects of that particular performance that we need to think about? Mm. And if it's a cognitive thing, then simple things that we could start with are about nutrition or food choices, adding one thing in, taking something out, you know, reducing your exposure to processed food, number one. If I'm eating takeout, you know, five days a week, could you eat four days? Start with one. It doesn't need to be Herculean, but it can start somewhere. That's, it, where, that's where a lot of people go wrong. It's like using that example. It's like, all right, well, I'm not going to eat out at ever all. Ever again. And then mm. a week later, I've broken. A mate of mine today, he's got diagnosis of uh, early onset rheumatoid arthritis. He's starting to get joint flare up. And I said, mate, I think an elimination diet might be a great place to start, but it's going to be hard. How, where do you want to start? He said, oh, Dave, yeah, I'll grab that resource that, you, that bloke you mentioned to me and I've had a look at his stuff and I jumped on it and I've done a week of it, but then I had six beers in KFC last night. <laughs> oh, right, Shout okay, KFC. Well, you, you, yeah, you, you're done then. Dirty chook. <laughs> you, you're done now. But it's those micro changes mm. because the all-in concept doesn't work. It mm. fails. It's the, diet, it's the diet sort of culture. Mm. I'm on a diet and then when we're off the diet, bang. So one step, small steps. What I really like about what you do is that you are, you take the big goal, you're like the conductor of these, this orchestra where you look at all these, these facets of life and you, all this goal that will, you know, the, the um, you look at the end goal, match up all the facets and then you just, in harmony, make them all flow. 
I think it can be really overwhelming, though. Oh, fucking you know, if nice. You know, if you said, oh, these are all the facets, it might be about... But for someone who's done it, like, so many times, like yourself, you can just break it down to go, this is number one. Yeah. And then we layer it on. But the thing that I find most powerful here, mate, is it's not about me. Mm. It's about them. And giving them the power to make a choice of what's important for them. I do a lot of revealing in the assessment process. I do a lot of revealing and education about what's going to help. But what do you want to do? What's important for you right now? Mm -hmm. What can work for you? Where do you see success in what are the things I've spoken about? So a guy that's come in, he's had a tropical disease infection from bloody going to Africa, plus onset of epilepsy from the age of six and his brain's not working all that well. And I said, what do you want to do? What resonates with you? And he pulled out and he said, oh, I really resonate with this Dave, this Dave and this Dave. And I went, awesome. Let's start that, but you're not doing anything else. This is it. We're going to talk to each other in 30 days, but your goals are blah. Do you agree to that? I make a kind of a contract with them. Mm. We're going to check in and I want to see how you're tracking with this. But do you believe that you can do this? Yes. What are the steps we need to do? You will talk to me or contact me if you're finding this hard. Mm. Can you see success? I have this internal self-efficacy view that I can do. If I've nailed that, my likelihood of moving to success for that person has gone from somewhere between 30% to mm. 80 to 90%. And that's yeah. something you can build on for and the next time. Yeah. Exactly. I've got mm. them winning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've got then you them. get that, always talk about a snowball. Yeah. You I've get that nice snowball effect that's happening. That's it. That's unreal. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> Do you find momentum can go both ways as well, though? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because that's something I always think about. Yep. You, you see one thing go, and the next thing go, and the next thing go. Yeah. yeah. And so it can get harder to get them. Exactly, back. Catch. One of the things that I, I certainly see is around uh, <laughs> mental health. You know, in the emergence of any sort of anxiety or depression, and if that rumbles on, it derails. It can get away. It so. can run away like a freight train. And it's those, when I see those flags and I'm like, we need to do something now. Mm. This is starting to emerge. Is it getting intrusive? Yes, we need to do this. We need to jump on this now. Yeah, right. Because if not, the snowball yeah, takes yeah, away. Yeah. And it just goes in the opposite direction. It does. To what we want. There's a, um, so, and this kind of ties into that sort of observation of neuroplasticity, which is the brain is such a dynamic organ to adapt and change to what we give it. And to borrow Star Wars, there's uh, the dark side and the yeah. light side. The light side is going to have function, benefit, emotionally really lovely place to be. Or the dark side is destructive, a barrier, hard to do, negative emotional qualities. How do we move away? Because we continue in that space, it's going to rumble on. Mm. Yeah. Man, to know, I mean, you're across so much stuff. How do you stay updated? Are you furthering study uh reading uh you're you mentioning a lot of podcasts like what's your go-to how much time do you have to set aside to uh, like not even stay up to date but like you said the, 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 the story of mm. the brain we're only here we've still got all of this yet or yeah. who knows where it goes you, you kind of well i listen to a couple of podcasts that's car time yep. um oh sorry in the I, you thought that was a name. I thought that was a name. Oh, of the podcast. In the, right, yeah. yeah. In the car. I was like, that sounds like a mechanics podcast. Cool. <laughs> I mean, it's keen on cars. Um, I, I've had the wonderful experience of reaching out to people that I want to talk to more about mm. all the cool stuff they do and pick their amazing brains. Mm. Yeah. You, you know? find in your field everyone's very open to discuss with each other. And um, some people are hanging on to their tricks of the trade, so to speak. I, I, I guess. Um, as an occupational therapist, our, our, our community of therapists can be quite um, focused on very specific things. Mm. And when it comes to neuro and understanding uh, neurological health and systems, it's very diverse and all of a sudden mushes out into quite a different complexity. Um, I lean towards an outlier position on comparing to the rest of my peers and that's more so about an interest in understanding mm. biological systems and I'm, I'm open to share but some folk I think for the majority are awesome in sharing that's mm. cool yeah because this I mean it sounds like a space where it's lack of a better word it sounds like we've only scratched the surface on what we actually know about 
what's going on inside there. Yeah, and I think the opportunity will be around um, big data using huge compu computational systems to yep. and algorithms to observe those associations better to understand <coughs> excuse me what are the threads what are the out of, <coughs> out of the enormity of it and taking that Pareto principle out of the 80 20 what's the 20 percent where our effort's going to get us 80 percent of the benefit yeah. because it's quite complex or it becomes more rich and detailed and personalized and that's yep. perhaps the other avenue is that um, personalized medicine um, individualized medicine is possibly the new frontier around what's your unique biological makeup, understanding your genetic, epigenetic, microflora, the sort of the gut biome, what's your exposures within your lived community environment, what's your nutritional intake, does that add up or subtract based on your, your genetic or epigenetic makeup particularly? Um, and out of that, we'll start to see a new world around dietary, exercise, lifestyle um, prescription, for sure. Wow. That's pretty cool. Mm. Man, I'm curious, and this is just a random question, something I always think about. When you forget something, short-term memory loss, and then you walk over there, you've forgotten it, and then you come back to location and you remember it. Mm -hmm. Why does that happen? Um, as in, why do we forget or why do we... Maybe both. Okay. Because <laughs> I know, for me, that's one of my best tricks. I'll forget some stuff, go back to where I'll stand in that room. Yeah. And then it's, and I'd it's back. Let me say, and let me go, if, and we'll just riff on this a bit. You walk over there and stress buckets over, where is it, what I've, I can't find it. Oh, absolutely. Do you remember it? When I go back to my location. Exactly. Yeah. So isn't it interesting that when we put ourselves in a stress state about what we've forgotten, yeah, yeah, yeah. it becomes greater, increasingly it's difficult. It's further away. It's further away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, that categorization clue. So we can, you know, think about it like an onion layer. Yeah. Um, sometimes we're really good at pulling the core out to go, that's it, I know yep. it. Sometimes we're far away that we actually can't perceive the outer cues of what I had to remember. Yep. But put myself in a space context, an environment, a touch context. I was here, I had my hand there, stop, breathe, pause, got it. So more so even a bit the slowing down yep. process is what's bringing that back. Yep, and softening. Isn't yeah. it? There's a quality of softening around don't hold on to that inquiry, expand it, let it go, let it emerge, bubble to the surface almost. And that experience enables us to soften rather than being in that possibly more sympathetic state to a softer state more yeah. parasympathetic relaxed state yeah. to go there it is boom yeah. got it pretty That's much pretty quietening cool. the mind down to let that answer come out yeah but sometimes it's a lot harder let's say we're in a really busy flight mode of work on a day and our to-do list is there and I might look at my to-do list and go hang on what was that about That's my life what was that about oh hold on hold on hold on that's it. And it might have been a facial cue. It might have been a task-driven cue. It might have been a special cue. But something's generated a response in me to go, got it. That's right. I've got to punch out the report with those specific mm. details. Mm. Um, so environment provides cue. Mm. Space provides cue. Time provides cue. Um, objects provide cue. Mm. Um, all these triggers around us help retrieve what we've laid down in our working memory pushed into a sense of short-term memory or possibly long-term memory mm. to be able to pull it back. And we rely on auditory and visual cues mm. to help place it. But then I'm saying that we can also rely on tactile cues, mm. pr you know, proprioceptive cues of what's happening in my joints, you know, can help retrieve. You rely on a whole host of cues when you go to lift. Mm. But you might dial into three language cues but then there's, we're working with you, there's also a visual cue mm. that you'll think about me to tap into. But then I'll also feel about that resistance on the bar, the grip, my breath, my brace, my hold. How does that feel? I'm mm. relying on some sort of internal sensory cue and it now builds me into a mode of performance that I can recall. Yeah. Yeah, sick. I know, I mean, from when I lift on a barbell, when I get that feeling, I know I'm on. And as soon as I do a certain grip or whatever, then that just triggers 
everything to do with purpose. Yeah. And then it just fucking works. It goes from thinking to, to, doing. to doing, essentially. So how can we get shorter with those cues? What's our 20%? Mm. In comp, what's our 20%? Is there a breath sequence? Is there a visualization sequence? Is there, you know, my coach isn't present. What do I need to do? What's my, what's my on switch? What grounds yourself in that moment yeah. under a bar? Yeah. And then after lifting, Something what is my recovery cue? Because I've got to lift again to try and hit my new benchmark. What's, yeah. my, what's my state to move to to help me perform again? And that's the thing we've spoken about in powerlifting. It's... I guess we're relating back, obviously, back to lifting now. It's we're up, we're, we get up, we warm up for squats, we have a break, we've got to come back down, be in a state of almost recovery. You've got to come back down? He, <laughs> unless you're Johnny, you just ride that caffeine wave the whole time. <laughs> but you, get, you come back down, and then you'd be up again for bench, and then you come back down, and then you'd be up again for deadlifts. So, right. really, only up, <laughs> uphill, tiger. Yeah, two tigers. <laughs> So you're constantly in this fluctuation of trying to get in and out of fight or flight. And that's something that we've spoken about coming back to the breath. But you might find that some people perform really well in a certain state Mm. and others don't. So it's figuring out what that state space is for your particular makeup and going, this is me. You've mentioned your cues. Mm are going to be entirely different to my state Mm. in approaching the bar. It's going to be entirely different to Brandon's state when he approaches the bar. Mm. Not all states are the same for everyone to get maximum performance. And so it's trying to figure that out. How do we figure that out? Well, one of those tools I think that are helpful is, you know, maybe HRV. Mm. You know, what's my heart rate variability? Where do I need to be? How do I get there? What are my cues? I know I'm on and I'm, I'm my best when I'm here, but I feel it subjectively at the moment. I feel, I understand that subjectively, meaning I'm trying to understand myself and that's a really messed up time because I'm jumping at false cues. Mm. You know, it could, I could be responding to, to false positives, which puts me in a hole elsewhere. But I might have some certain objective measures that read me that I can respond to and manage myself to something. And I think that's, that's perhaps where the opportunity is about figuring out what are the tools to give me objective feedback to go, this is where I need to be, this is how I get there, this is my process to do that. And then do it without the tool. I don't need the tool anymore. Mm. I'm beyond the tool, I've got it, I've nailed it. This is me. Just second nature. Yeah, I know how to, f- I, n- I know what that is now. Yeah. Damn. Damn. Well, my brain is uh, <laughs> a little on fire. We've got to ask the question, bro. We, got, we do have a question that we did put up on the podcast. Oh, okay. Uh, on our Instagram, sorry. I got it here. Yeah. Uh, how can a 60 plus year old man best maintain their memories and memories and memory function? That's from uh, one of my boys, uh, 66. Okay. Um, shout out, shout out, Pete. Pete, Pete. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome Pete. question. Okay, triad leader. Um, he is the triad leader. I would think we can approach it from a couple of pillars. Number one, nutrition eating a nutrient-dense diet, plant-based predominantly with good, yummy proteins. If you're lifting heaps, make sure you're getting your protein in there. Mm. Um, Pete, that's you. But thinking about um, wanting that nutrient density. And nutrient density, particularly as we get older, our stomach becomes much less efficient at breaking these foods down. And then we put it into our reliant on our beautiful, rich gut biome of which we've traumatized throughout life through whatever choices we've made, whatever stuff we put in it, they've become less efficient, but they're still with us. We need to have things as rich and beautiful, full of information as possible because putting stuff in us that isn't as rich, we are depriving opportunity to pull out those micronutrients. And then the question then would be, if I'm not getting enough, I might need to supplement to fill that gap. But diet first, supplement much later if you have to make that decision. Sleep and getting on top of our sleep hygiene, that sleep ritual, would be number two and often overlooked. Mm. Um, Investigating how I'm sleeping. Uh, If I'm having a disrupted sleep, if I'm waking up in the morning, I'm not feeling energetic, nourished, ready, comfortably okay then something's going on am i getting into that 
beautiful sleep cycle? Am I taking caffeine beyond midday? Am I eating too close to sleep? Am I trying to take sleeping tablets to help me get to sleep? Have I got anxiety that's ruminating and it's disrupting me in my sleep? Have I got tension that's pervasive in my sleep that's causing grinding or holding on and I'm not dropping into that sleep? Am I drinking alcohol? So all these things can play Mm. um, on our sleep quality. So sleep quality would be the other one. Um, And obviously it sounds like Pete Mm. is um, coming into the gym. Yeah. And Pete Pete talks about it his age and, and he's done it since like his age of 60 he's like man this is the best years of my life yeah as i get older the he loves his kids but they're not around anymore so the distraction of the kids are no longer there he's got all the money he he's generated which is enough for him he talks about now he's got access to his super and he's almost towards a semi-retired state so he talks about this is the best time of his life yeah and i think he's doing everything he can to to protect that diversity um around thinking of those you know Uh, slight stresses around we're doing resistance-based exercise but making sure we're getting the platter of movement opportunities around new learning movements, movement patterns through to um, raising a heart rate, hitting into a bit of HIT, short window but getting that exposure because what we're doing is we're having some beautiful elasticity across a a narrowing band as we get older our range of flexibility physiologically is getting narrower and narrower we want to maintain that band as much as possible to allow that sort of diversity which then converts to resilience over time Mm. so if we can maintain that through these choices we're 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 putting ourselves in a much better position Mm. Um, um i was thinking something about pete and his choices. The other thing is to think about... Um, sure, Pete's made a lot of wrong choices. <laughs> um, uh, yes. New learning. Ex- yeah. learning. Exposure like to new learning. And, and that may be tying in activities that you've not done before. You might be passionately curious or I've got some question mark that I might like it. Anywhere on that continuum of a flaming passion to... I'm kind of curious is the cue to go to that sliding door to open up and go let's explore that Mm -hmm. because when we offer our brains this diversity of new learning rather than being stuck in our patterns we are then providing an opportunity to light up our brain and this now I'll, I'll, I'll just finish off with an opportunity for Pete is that when he comes into the gym or when he does some exercise and he's raised his heart rate up. Within a one hour window after doing that is then to pursue something that is novel, new and different in a new learning perspective. Whether that be brain training, which has only got a short duration effect and not very wide effect in terms of our cognitive skills. But when we pursue an activity, which is rich, learning a new instrument. What we see in the differences between the brains that have just had exercise versus the brains that have exercise plus new learning is that the brain with exercise has some good benefits, but it lights up from a blood perfusion perspective only a little bit, but it's lit up on a scanning perspective. When we look at the brain that's done exercise and then add in a new learning, it lights up like the sun. So what we have here is that the nutritional requirements of the brain placed in the context of new learning demands physiologically much more nutrients, much more blood flow, much more engagement from a network perspective, and therefore we're creating the conditions for change and adaptation. So tie effort with a bit of new learning, tie effort in the gym with a lift and then doing something mentally at the same time or within a short window of time afterwards, you're milking that baby for as much as you can. That's interesting because I've seen a couple of studies, one one for um, education to do it after training, mm-hmm. particularly in a unit, like people at university is where I've heard it. And, you know, if you've got some uni and lecturing and stuff to learn or stuff or an assessment or something to do, train first, then go do it and you'll perform better. Mm-hmm. Um, the other one I thought that was pretty cool was one around Alzheimer's and an older generation um, coming into the gym. Significantly reduced chance of just from the new things they learned from gym 
itself mm -hmm. because it's new in itself was plus the strength and resistance training that comes with it. There was a wonderful um, longitudinal study um, years ago that followed a group of nuns and they were kind enough to give their brains to science when they passed away. And these nuns um, were, were good because um, we didn't have too many phenomena around this group that were different. They ate the same stuff, they had the same routines, they had pretty much a similar lifestyle mm. throughout their life because they're in the convent, they're, they're part of a certain group. So those variables were ironed out. Now, when they passed away, there was a group of nuns, let's call them 40%, had gorgeous, beautiful brains. And like, yeah, it makes sense because all the cognitive testing and all the stuff that we saw in this group were fine. And then there was, you know, another 20 to 30% of nuns that when they looked at their brains, they went, it makes sense. It's, it's like Swiss cheese in here because they showed all the indicators that they were declining in function, they p scored poorly on their cognitive assessments and they had greater dependency. And so, yes, they, they demonstrated all the facets of dementia. And then they had a look at another group of nuns and let's say they were about 20%. I hope I got my numbers right there. But let's say 20%. So a smaller minority, a smaller group. When they looked at these women's brains, they opened up and they went, oh my God, how could this be? These brains look like women that have dementia, yet they did not have dementia. Pooh, why is that the case? And there's a, um, a lovely um, story around this, around Sister Mary. And Sister Mary went to a GP and she was a university lecturer right up until her 80s. And then uh, she ended up living on to, I think, about 96. And her GP, she went to her GP and said, you're keeping me away from all the, all the stuff that you're doing to me. You're keeping me away from God. They said, no, Sister Mary, I'm not keeping you away from God. It's the choices that you're making and the life that you're deciding to leave which is doing that. And Sister Mary was an example of this group, which was she had a longing and a commitment for lifelong learning. Mm. continuing to make an investment in the brain bank account. And that then built and then established the, the um, theory of cognitive reserve. We keep making an investment into the brain bank account. Yeah, and I'd well, encourage Pete to do that. Yeah, yeah. All of us both sounds good. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, fuck You'll me. You'll start reading some books. <laughs> <laughs> Damn. I've got, a, I've got a, um, a weird one for you. Do you reckon... Um, have you ever seen the movie Transcendence? No. no. Oh, you haven't? Johnny Depp. They download his brain onto a computer. Isn't that Lucy? No, that's a, no. She puts her brain onto the computer. Oh, she puts it onto yeah, a USB. Yeah, USB. Transcendence. Johnny Depp's about to die from I don't know, something, and they, and he's a, the head of his little science field, and it's downloading his brain. You reckon right. we'll ever see that? Yeah, it kind of sounds a, a fairly similar to um, Altered Carbon, that Netflix. Yeah, is, where, similar sort of. Where they they jump between what do they call them skins. Skins or yeah. sins or yeah, yeah, skins. Um, We've got a long way to go. I mean, yeah. when you think about the, 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 the brain's connectivity and the amount of interactions that are happening, our brain has an energy requirement of about powering a laptop a day. Yep. The equivalent first computer that had the same amount of connections as our brain was called Blue Jeans, I think. And she required, or she, I'm talking, to, you know, labeling it now, but uh, it required um, the power of a small city to run. Ooh because of the demands. And that, though, those connections were one is to one. What we have is Billions. one is to 10,000 10, relationship yeah. at one end and one is to 10,000 at the other. So we've got all these connections that are happening very quickly. And we've not been able to replicate anything like that. We will, Yeah. but it's a long way not away. Not for now. Damn. Then we, then we are the computer. Mm. We are in the matrix then. then. Then we are the simulation. Damn. That's where I was going. Yeah, I got you. I got you. I finished <laughs> your sand sandwiches. Oh, yeah, we got 10 questions. Yeah, we got 10 oh, questions. Oh, right. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, we asked, 10, okay. that, they were just it. random questions I wrote that I needed to know about. Yeah. Now we have the real questions. <laughs> These are the real, like, rapid fire answer. Ooh, yeah. first thing you're going to be on the edge of the seat. That this is what's going to make you famous. That high <laughs> stress moment. Yeah. yeah, you're gonna want to do some of your le new learning stuff after this because we're gonna put you in a state. Uh, yeah, are you ready? I look forward to it. Question no, number don't. one: You have 30 seconds to tell the world anything you want. Go. Keep learning. Be good to yourself and others. Eat good stuff. Have fun. 
do with a smile. Be curious. And you know, the, the thing about curiosity, I think, is beautiful. Cultivate, spend time cultivating those positive emotions because we get too trapped in sort of an anxiety state. Um, and love. Bam. You really rocked the two most stressful questions. Yeah, that one puts people, that challenges them. That really <laughs> does challenge them. What is the uh, strangest thing you own, ha uh, think about, or do? Strange thing. Hanging out with me is pretty strange. So yeah, hey. hanging out with Brandon's so often, Lee. No, it's pretty, pretty wonderful. Um, I love ocean swimming. Ooh. To get ready for that, I end up dialing to the whole Wim Hof technique, ice yeah. baths, that sort of stuff. Um, I really, really enjoy that. Um, we had a Johannes, Johannes egg, 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 eggs. Johannes Eggs, we're going to call. Yeah. Shout he, out. He was, we had um, him on. Okay. Yeah, he worked um, for, um, Wim, for Hoff. Wim Hof at his big demos and stuff in Australia. Oh, awesome. He was the dude on stage with him. Yeah. You'd love that. Yeah. I mean, you've already listened to it because... I mean, yeah, you, you loved that. It's, it's the platform. Like. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> What's the uh, most important quality in a human? Oh, this one's something. Compassion. Nice. What made-up word would you like to see enter the English language? Oh. <laughs> there's, you know, there's a beautiful coffee shop near, near me that does this all the time, and I just think, oh, that's a great word. That's a great word. Um, um, uh, I'm stumped on that one. All righty. I'll come back to it. Okay. We'll come back. Pass for now. What is your first memory? Running on the farm when nice. I was a young kid. How do you feel about wombats? <laughs> awesome. <laughs> They're awesome. What's something you learned last week? How to take care of my bees. Well, you're bees. Bees, bees rock. Yeah, you got native just, bees or no the, European? Yeah. Ligurian bees. How much honey are you running? You got? Well, they're babies. I got them yeah. as a swarm, so they're sort of trying to. Fill out Bit their uh, their nuke at the moment. Yep. So, uh, but understanding bees, that that I could sit there and watch them. They are amazing. I, you know, when they come out of the hive, I, the thing that blows my mind at the moment is, and it's a sort of bit of a Trekkie type, Star Trekkie type observation, is that when they come out of the hive, they do this like little curve out of the hive, and then they just drop into warp speed, and they know where they're going. But I lose visual contact of them about after about three metres. They're yeah. bam, they're gone. Warp Yet, speed. when I stand in front of the hive in that sort of pathway, yeah. they drop out of warp speed before, you know, in that zone and they navigate around me. It's like they've had the, perimeter, the proximity warning yeah. jumping on their dashboard. <laughs> That's, <laughs> That's awesome. cool. Um, what's your perfect Saturday Arvo slash evening? Um, I, I'd love chilling out in the garden. And then winding up with a, a cold beer. Nice. What's your beer? Oh, yeah. I, I really got into, lately, um, the, the Canberran brewery, um, Bent Spoke. Bent Spoke. And they have the beer called the Crankshaft. <laughs> and it is awesome. They're a bunch of cyclists, mad group. Yeah. But just nice flavour. Yeah. That's a beer. Yeah, it's a nice beer. Do you believe in ghosts? No. Thank God. <laughs> What's the last thing you're going to say before you die? Oh. Love you all. Bam. Love you all. Such a fucking good, wholesome yeah. person. You were the nice Coming back to that other question, what do you want to see in the English dictionary? Uh, yeah. I'm, I would love to see more because it's a French word. What? So it's, it's, it's a, not a made-up word, but I love it. And it's called um, bricolage. Yeah. And bricolage um, represents things pulled together with strings and love. And so that's when we get together as an effort and do something as a community or do th something as a group. And we do it without any sense of reward. We just do it together. So things pulled together with strings and love, bricolage. bricolage. I think it's a pretty cool word. You know, you know how we always argue who's the best? I feel like it's just him now. We are now playing for second. Yeah, it's... it's, <laughs> it's <laughs> It's everyone on this on listening has seen well, our Brandon is the best. Well, 
But it's not even true now because Dave is clearly the best. <laughs> that was probably one of the most wholesome podcasts we've done. I loved every second of that. I think it's one of our... No, how long did we go for? Yeah, that is one of our longest with one guest. Mm-hmm. Right. We've done we've done a two hour one, but we had three or four people on. Sorry, pegs. We got a new. Yeah, kid fuck. I'm going to introduce you to our friend Paul. Awesome. He's gonna like having you two on would just be we'll be here for three hours. Yeah. At minimum, yeah, but um, sandwich. <laughs> we will need intro intro foods. Um, mate, that was brilliant. Thank you very what, much for having me. No, like I think it's absolute pleasure. Um, I don't even know how to wrap this up because I don't really want to wrap it up, but. Where can people find you? You run the podcast Health Made Easy. Yeah, so... Memory I've, Health Made Easy. I have Memory Health Made Easy um, as a podcast. Spotify? It's Spotify and everywhere. There's memoryhealthmadeeasy.com with a lot of resources and blogs there. And I've got, obviously, my occupational therapy practice here in Brisbane, oh, which yeah, is we, occupational therapy we barely, Brisbane. You're a business owner. We forgot about that, amongst <laughs> all the other things. <laughs> we'll put all those uh, in the show notes for people to reach out. Um, obviously, all your contacts are on there. Man, like, that was... That was a good hour and a half. I, I feel like I could keep going. I just want to keep going. It was brilliant. Um, got a lot of information. We'll have to get you back on. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you so much for giving up your time on this Saturday afternoon. It was a great pleasure to have you on. Enjoy the rest of your hour and go enjoy that beer. Hey, thank you very much, guys.